Now let's talk about sensor data. Why do we need sensor data at all? So if we now look at our solution, we could be happy with it, so it's pretty smooth, but we don't know if it is correct. So in order to find that out, let us load the reference trajectory. And this is called robot4reference.txt. Now let's look at this. So in red, you now have the reference trajectory that was obtained from tracking the robot via the overhead camera. So let's go back to the start. Well, in the beginning, the reference point and the trajectory that you computed from the motor ticks, they are the same. That's because I have given you the start position, which I just grabbed from the reference trajectory. And as we move along, things are pretty good as long as we go straight. But then at a certain moment, we see that as the robot starts to turn, there is a deviation. It seems that the curve it takes has a too small radius. And this leads to a deviation. And this goes on, so the next curve is also too small radius. So, and as you see, everything is bent here. And after a while, our robot is in a completely wrong position. So as you remember, I have measured the width of the robot. I've given you the width of 150 millimeters. So, but it was not so quite clear where the middle of those robot tracks were. So one thing you can do in your filter mode of file exercise, you can change the robot's width. So let's change that to say 160 millimeters and then just run it. Now we can go back to our visualization and just press reload all. And as you could see right now, the trajectory moved a little bit. It's better now. So the turns it takes, they are still too narrow, but it's better. So let's try another value. Let's try, say, 173. Go back and reload. And as you see now, we are pretty good now. So by setting a good parameter value, we obtain a trajectory that is much better, but still this should leave you somehow worried because the width of the robot is now just assumed to be 173. We never measured that. It just seems that this is a good value. So what we do here is actually a calibration of the values. But the problem with this is it might work now very well for our current robot and for our current ground. So, but if we use another ground, we still may be off because we will have a different slip of the robot on the ground. So we need another solution. And this will be the measurement of our landmarks by using our LiDAR. Now let's have a look at the LiDAR data. So open up the log file viewer and in your directory for this unit, locate the robot for scan text. So this file contains all the scan data from our robot's LiDAR. Just open this. And on the right hand side, you see the robot's coordinate system. So the things you saw so far were on the left hand side of our viewer, which is in world coordinates. And on the right hand side, we have the scene shown in the robot's coordinate system. Now let's move the slider. And you see that is the LiDAR data that the robot sees. So as the robot travels through the arena, it measures those points. The robot moves forward and forward is his X direction. And then the scanner scans from here to here, all those beams. It's a total of 660 beams. And then behind the robot, there's a zone where it can't see anything. Now, what are those spikes? You remember those landmarks in the scene. Well, every landmark leads to one of those spikes here. So if the landmark is here, then the laser rays that go along here, they hit this landmark and the landmark casts a shadow. So currently, if you look here, we have one, two, three, four, five landmarks overall. And as I go through the scene, this varies. So in the starting position, I do have one, two, three, four, five, six landmarks. And remember, these were all the landmarks that we had in our scene. And as I move a little bit, for example, here to step 17, you see one of the landmarks disappears in the shadow of the other landmark. And so we only have five of them. And this goes on. When we are back here, we only see two landmarks. We go around here. At this position, we only see one landmark. And then we go back here. Again, here's a shadow landmark. Now it moves out of the shadow and so on. This is our entire scans as seen from the robot's perspective. Now, as all the other data, 
the scan data is just a text file. And so if you look into the directory for this unit, you will find the robot4scan.txt file, which we just opened in our log file viewer. So this file contains one line per scan position. So you can see here's the first line that starts. It wraps around here. It goes on and on. So it starts with an S. It goes on and on. And then here's the next line. So and in between all those values are measurement values. It goes on like that. And the entire file, this is our 278 scans, each one having 660 range measurements. So how is one record of one scan line stored? Well, as always, we do have a code that starts the line. In this case, it is an S for scanned data. And then there's a timestamp, 315 milliseconds. Then there's a count, meaning there's 660 values which follow now and then this is just all the values so this is 660 entries and those values are the depth values of the scanner now let's plot the scan data in the files you downloaded there's a python plot scan file and it's very short and simple so it imports from pylab for plotting then it imports everything from lego robot then it loads the log file in that case it loads the scan data and then it just plots the scan data. Now log file dot scan data means this is the list of all scans. And so if we take the seventh scan here, we just have to index that by a seven. Now let's have a look. And this is how it looks like. This is our 660 scan values down here. That's the indices. And this is the depth that the scanner delivers. So you see, the robot stands close to a wall of his arena. And so this causes the depth values going up here. And then there's one of those spikes, which means here's a landmark. We can see more of those spikes. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. So all of our six landmarks are visible in this scan. Now let's have a look at another scan. I now switch to scan number eight. Let's run it. And the outcome is this. And so since the robot didn't move very much, we still have our one, two, three, four, five, six spikes, but we also have an artifact here. So if you look at that, you can see this is a spike going down. So it's an error in the measurements and it's going down to the value of zero. Well, almost, let's have a look. It's not really zero. It's something like 15. So in order to filter out the bad values, we will assume a threshold of 20, meaning we will not use any measurement value that is closer than two centimeters to the robot scanner. Now let's think about the strategy to find the cylinders in the scan. Now, as you have seen, the scan data looks like that. We do have a certain depth, and then there's a cylinder in the foreground, which means there will be a depth jump in our scan data it scans across the cylinder and then it will jump back to hit the background wall. In the real world, this will look as follows. There will be a cylinder, there will be some wall in the background and the scanner now will shoot its rays. It will hit the background, then it will start to hit the cylinder. These are these values here. And after it went across the cylinder, it will go back here and go on hitting the wall. So this will somehow go on, go around the corner here maybe, and then it will hit another cylinder and so on. So now what's our strategy to find those spikes? Well, as we can see, there's a strong negative slope at the beginning of a cylinder and a strong positive slope at the end of the cylinder. Let's think about how the derivative looks like. It's going up here, so it will be positive. Then there's this strong negative peak. So the derivative will be like that. And that's flat actually, so it will be zero. And there will be a strong positive peak here. And then it will rise here for a little bit. It will switch to a slight negative slope. Then again, there will be this strong negative peak and this strong positive peak. So our strategy will be to set up a threshold and just say whenever the derivative is larger than the threshold, then we will detect this as a falling or rising edge. So in this case, because it is strongly negative, this will be a falling edge or the left edge of a cylinder. This will be the right edge of a cylinder. And again, here we will have the left edge and the right edge. So how do we determine the derivative? Now from image processing, you know, we can do this using discrete masks. The derivative at a discrete position i, that is approximately the function at position i plus one minus the function at i divided by the step, which is in this case one. That's also termed the difference quotient. But this function introduces a phase shift, so we'll use another one. And since there is now 
i plus 1 and i minus 1, the difference in step is 2, I have to divide by 2. So now let's implement this and I prepared this file scan derivative question for you. Let's have a look at this. So there's the main function down here. It sets up a constant which is 20 which is the minimum distance that we will assume to be a valid measurement value. So any distances below 20 millimeters are considered to be an error. And then it just loads the log file. It picks out a scan like number 7 and you're encouraged to try out your implementation with different scan numbers. Then it just assigns the log file scan to scan and then it computes the derivative using the function that you'll have to implement up here. And then it just plots all the values. It plots the scan as well as the derivatives. Now let's have a look at this compute derivative function. So it gets the scan. So the scan will be a list of values, of depth values. So let's say this will be something like 100 and 110 and so on. And in the end, the last value might be 550. The first item will have index 0, the second will have index 1. The last one with our scanner will be index number 659 because there will be 660 scanned values overall in our scan. Remember I told you to compute the derivative using this formula. So if i is 0, right, you will access element minus 1 and plus 1. And of course, you don't want to do that. Actually, Python will let you do that, but it will give you, for the index minus 1, this value here, assuming that the list is cyclic and this is not what we want. So the solution here is I start with index 1 and I run until index the length of the scan minus 1, which means the last index is actually the length of the scan minus 2. So this will be the last index that is being accessed and this will be the first index. So now since we only compute now these values here, we will have a total of 658 values in our final list. But I want the final list to have exactly the same length as the original list. So what I do here is I start by adding a zero and I append a zero in the end. And you will have to replace this append here by appending your computer derivative value. And for now I place there a funny function just to remind you to fill that out. 